Hey everyone, and welcome to Tony for The Gods and the Demons You Harbor. I mean Tony for you. Shin Megami Tensei has a ton of demons, and I've made a list of my personal favorites from the bunch. Persona, however, has its own share of unique designs. These personas are handcrafted to reflect the heart of the user, and are of much more personal significance to the games they appear in. While many demon designs are used multiple times, persona designs are a manifestation of one's soul and the mask they use to go through life. This inevitably leads to more creative liberties taken that reflect the user in a significant way. I wanted to share my picks for the best persona designs in the series, how they reflect the historical figure and also the persona user as well. Not simply if the design is nice to look at, but the lore and significance surrounding it. Since I finished my meaning behind the persona series recently, now seemed like a good time to give my thoughts on which ones are the best. This list will obviously focus on starting and super personas of the party members and protagonists of the games, as most other personas are simply demon designs for mainline. Without any further ado, let's get to the list. Number 5. Necronomicon. Futaba Sakura from Persona 5 starting persona. Of the Hermit Arcana. The Necronomicon comes from Lovecraftian canon. It appears in many of Lovecraft's books, and is consistently described as a magical grimoire of the dead, and is one of the only personas that is not a living being. According to the book, History of the Necronomicon, released after the passing of H.P. Lovecraft himself, the grimoire was originally titled Al-Azif, an Arabic word which the book translates to that nocturnal sound, the howling of demons. In very Lovecraft fashion, the exact contents of the book's pages are unknown. The author of the Necronomicon was Al-Hazred, described as the Mad Arab, known to worship the elder gods of the mythos like Cthulhu and Yog sothoth Al-Hazred visited the ruins of Babylon, explored the subterranean secrets of Memphis, Egypt, and after all that, wrote the Al-Azif in Damascus, Syria. His death happened shortly after, where his body was seized by an invisible creature in broad daylight and devoured horribly before a large number of fright-frozen witnesses. The contents of the book no doubt contain knowledge so vast that simply reading it would drive one to madness. Many other works that include the Necronomicon describe it as the Book of the Dead, a necromantic tome allowing the reader the ability to speak to departed souls, or even bring them back to life. For Futaba Sakura, this persona is of incredible significance. When you first meet her, she's suffering from trauma-induced hallucinations, and feelings of self-hatred so bad she wishes to take her own life. She's obsessed with the seeming part she played in her mother's passing, and the only thing that got her through the long days was her insatiable hunger for knowledge. Granted, knowledge of coding and hacking computers isn't very similar to necromancy, but it's esoteric knowledge nonetheless. Her palace being in Egypt hearkening back to Alhazred's exploration of the secrets of Memphis, as well as her obsession with death and the souls of the departed fit the persona perfectly. The design is that of a flying saucer with a gargoyle on top, and tentacles protruding from the bottom. On the inside, it contains a seemingly infinite wealth of knowledge regarding shadows and the layout of the cognitive world, as well as the ability to save the party from peril. This is one of the best ways of incorporating the lore of the persona and the role of the team member in the series. Number 4. Callisto, Ulala Serizawa from Persona 2 starting Persona, of the Star Arcana. Callisto of Greek lore was the nymph daughter of King Lycaon and faithful servant of Artemis, goddess of the moon and hunt. According to myth, Callisto caught the eye of Zeus, but in order to serve under Artemis, a vow of chastity must be upheld. Zeus knew of this and transformed himself into the likeness of Artemis to seduce her, resulting in her carrying Zeus's child. Though it's never really explained why Callisto never questioned why Artemis had the means to impregnate her in the first place. Artemis and Callisto both came to the realization that Callisto had broken the vow of chastity and was banished for it. If that wasn't bad enough, Zeus's wife Hera held on to the grudge of her husband's infidelity, and right after Callisto gave birth to Zeus's child, Arcus, she was transformed into a bear. Years later, Callisto resigned to her fate of being a bear, and caught the eye of a hunter. None other than her son Arcus was going to kill her. But right before she died, she was set among the stars as Ursa Major in very Greek fashion. Callisto shares much with Ulala, as they are both characters beset by horrible love lives. Callisto and Ulala are both tricked by horrible men and punished greatly for it. Though Ulala never turned into a bear, she devoted much of her adult life to learning martial arts to one day get back at her abuser. Callisto is perhaps one of the most visually striking personas, tied with bondage ropes and literally being stepped on with a high heel shoe driven into her head. At the same time, she stands confidently, brandishing a whip and wearing deep red and white, colors evoking passion as well as purity. Both Callisto and Ulala are strong women despite the horror brought upon them by their past mistakes. 
one of the most interesting personas and side characters to dissect in any of my Personas Explained videos, despite her being a side character almost exclusively used for comic relief, goes to show the thought put into every single one of the initial Personas. Number 3. Io, Yukari Takebo's starting Persona from Persona 3, of the Lover's Arcana. Back again with another Greek legend. Io was the daughter of Inachus, King of Argus, and the sea nymph Milia. Io caught the eye of Zeus, much like Callisto, but to make things worse, Io was a priestess of Hera, Zeus's own wife. Zeus seduced Io and brought her to a cloud formation, and after the deed was done, to hide her, transformed her into a cow. Hera saw through the disguise immediately and demanded Zeus give her the cow as a gift. She later assigned Argus the All-Seeing to guard her from ever seeing Zeus again. Basically, she was imprisoned for life as a cow. What's not normal about this story is Zeus assigning Hermes to save the innocent Io from her prison. Hermes succeeded in his mission to save Io by lulling Argus to sleep and brought her far from Greece. Sometime later, Hera sent out a gadfly to search for Io and it ended up traveling all the way to Egypt. There, Io was not only back to her original form, but identified as the Egyptian goddess of magic, Isis, and with a child of her own, Apis, the sacred bull. For Yukari, both her original and super personas are such a natural progression that mirrored the actual story of Io so well I couldn't ignore it. So I guess both of them are sharing this spot on the list. Relating to Yukari, while parents are far from gods, for a young girl, the whims of your parents may as well seem like decrees from the heavens, as they can affect your life in major ways. Yukari's entire young adult life was spent mourning the death of her father, resenting her mother, and searching for a reason to harbor so much hate. Over the course of the game, Yukari takes time for herself, begins to understand more of her personal situation and the world around her, and overcomes her past trauma. The seeming loss of your family can emotionally destroy someone, but with the help of her friends and maturity to see past her initial feelings transcends her spite and matures far more than anyone would in her scenario. The design of Io being a young girl chained to a bullhead symbolically mirrors the Greek legend and evolving into Isis is spot on. These personas are a great example of the thought placed on every aspect of the game's writing. Number 2. Lucia, Fuka Yamagishi starting persona from Persona 3, of the Priestess Arcana. You all must have known some Abrahamic lore had to have been on the list one way or another. Lucia of Syracuse, better known today as Saint Lucia or Saint Lucy, was a Christian martyr and one of the many who died during the Diocletianic persecution. The last and most horrible persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire starting in the year 303. Lucia lived in service to God. Devout to him, she lived in alms and consecrated her virginity. Lucia's mother, Eutysia, however, arranged for her daughter to marry a wealthy pagan man, ignorant of her daughter's pledge. Lucia refused to marry the man in an attempt to remain pure for God, and in turn brought suspicion on her faith. Her mother eventually relented, but the man she was to marry was enraged and called the magistrate. They threatened to defile her in a brothel, and tasked her with burning a sacrifice in the image of the emperor, but she refused. The magistrate was in shock. Infuriated, they ordered her immediate execution, and the guards seized her. However, Lucia knelt down in reverence to God, and she could not be moved. Groups of guards pulled and pushed to no avail. She was even hitched to a team of oxen, yet didn't move an inch. They tried to lay bundles of firewood under her, yet they would not light. Even more enraged, the magistrate would not have her go unpunished, and Lucia was to have her eyes gouged out and her throat slashed. Despite all the torture, she could still see and prophesy the quick end of Christian persecution in the nation. Eventually, out of ideas, she was unceremoniously stabbed to death. Shortly after her death marked the end of Christian persecution in the nation for good. When she was being prepped for burial, they found her eyes had been restored, more beautiful than they had been in life. One of the most hardcore stories behind a persona in the series, the persona bestows the innocent and pure Fuka with the ability to help her friends as a scout. She can sense almost anything from extreme distances, and when summoned, her persona wraps Fuka in a bubble, rendering her almost completely invulnerable and immovable. The design depicts a woman whose eyes and throat are covered in bandages, in a formal dress with arms stretched gazing up into the heavens. Navigators always seem to get amazing personas, Fuka having the most interesting of them all. And finally, number one. Seimen Kongo, the protagonist of Persona 1, Naoya starting Persona, of the Emperor Arcana. Seimen Kongo of Hindu lore is a Rakshasa and protector deity in Japanese lore. Oddly enough, Rakshasa are considered cannibalistic demons, bringers of death and disease, and harboring the ability to possess humans to commit evil acts. Seimen Kongo is unique amongst his people for turning away from his evil nature and now protects humans from sickness and evil influence. 
The persona design is quite different from his usual depictions, with religious tools often held by Hindu deities like the Vajra, wheel, and staff all representing different aspects of Hindu and Buddhism. The inspiration for the persona design is much more likely to be from the cult of Koshin, which is a folk faith in Japan with Taoist origins. In this belief, Seimen Kongo is a being representing the fifth day of the monkey in the Chinese calendar, a day many of the faith believe to be deathly unlucky. In order to prevent the great misfortune, practitioners would gather the scrolls of Sarutahiko and Seimen Kongo in order to hold a ceremony to honor them. The way many chose to represent Seimen Kongo specifically in their homes was the use of three monkey carvings. Each monkey individually covers their eyes, mouth, and ears, representing see no evil, speak no evil, and hear no evil, respectively. Seimen Kongo, I believe, is one of the best representations for a Persona silent protagonist in the entire series. Many view Naoya as a blank slate. But through careful attention to the choices you make on your way to the true ending and the comments of party members, you can piece together some personality. Through those, it can be understood that Naoya outwardly is a serious, if blunt, and honest young man. An aspect of the game many people overlook, but is integral to understanding the main character, is the events unfolding at Alaya Cavern near the end of the game, where you come face to face with Naoya's shadow. Here, Naoya is portrayed as a selfish recluse, unwilling to help anyone if it rips him away from his hedonistic desires so basically an average teenager. Despite his nature, however, Naoya rises to the occasion when the time comes for it, risking his life throughout the events of Persona 1 to help those close to him. Seeing the good in people, speaking only the truth, and hearing the needs of his friends and the world. Seimen Kongo is the perfect Persona to start the series off with. That was the list. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts on my list and your own personal top 5 Personas in the comments section down below. And while you're down there, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Sadly, no Personas from Persona 4 made it onto the list. Despite it being my favorite game in the series, most of the Personas are... just okay. Special thanks to Anton, Big T, Frankie Stoned, Heavenly Potato, Jim Taylor, Just a Middleman, Konyuna, Matt M, Mega X 454, Mr. Eight Eyes, POTW Gold, The Toaster Messiah, Video Gamer 75, and many more for supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. Thanks for watching this top personas list, and I'll see you in the next, Tony for you. Have a good one.